Well, you all know that we celebrate the centennial of the Bohr atom this year, of course. I mean, that's partly what, what we're here for. And, uh, okay, thank you. And the scientific background and understanding of the physics involved uh, has been studied extensively and is fairly well known, uh, owing to people or one person among us here, in particular John Hadron. Uh, in this lecture, I will rather ask about the sources for Bohr's enormous creativity necessary for his scientific breakthrough. I will seek to argue that these sources can be found to a great extent in Bohr's private life, his relationship with his family, father, mother, brother, aunt, and perhaps even more, his fiancée, Margrethe Nörlun, with whom he became engaged in 1910 and was to marry two years later. So this talk will be quite different from the rest here. During the engagement period, Bohr defended his uh, doctorate in physics at the University of Copenhagen in May 1911. And I've forgotten about this, so I should uh, show you. Yeah, this is, yeah. He defended um, uh, his doctorate in physics at the University of Copenhagen. That was news in the Danish newspapers. That was in May 1911. He went to Cambridge in September the same year to continue his studies and moved to Manchester in April the following year, where he stayed until he went back home and got married. The time in England, and especially the last two months in Manchester, constituted the beginning of Bohr's interest in the nuclear atom and of his quest for solving the riddles posed by it. I am very grateful to the Bohr family, represented in particular by Niels Bohr's son, Ernest Bohr, for giving me special access to the extensive collection of the early love letters between Niels Bohr and Margrethe Nörlund. These letters, together with correspondence with Niels Bohr's closest family, shed entirely new light, I think you will see, on his personality and the sources for his creativity. In a sense, mentally, Bohr remained in his home milieu in Copenhagen even while he was physically away in England. And that is the reason for the title of my talk. Uh, my talk is based, uh, to a great extent, on a recently published book by uh, John Heilbronn and myself. And I would like to use the opportunity here uh, to thank John for a very pleasant and fruitful collaboration. Thank you. But let us now start by going back to Boer's upbringing. Nils's father, Christian Boer, was a physiologist at the University of Copenhagen twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And if he had got it, it would have been three generations, which would, which have, which would have been too much, probably. <laughs> Nils's mother, Ellen Bohr, I'm sure you can identify her on the picture, born Adler, was the daughter of a prominent Jewish banker. And Christian fell for Ellen when she studied with him. Then we have Nils's older sister, Jenny Bohr, the oldest sibling who became a teacher. And then we have Nils's brother, Harald Bohr, who was to become an international renowned mathematician. And then, of course, we have uh, Nils Bohr himself a little diffuse in the picture. The family was broadly intellect intellectual. The siblings were allowed to listen to discussions in the home between the four Ps, uh, which they are called, 
The philologist Wilhelm Thompson, that's the order of people in the drawing there, the philosopher Harl Höfting, the physiologist Christian Bohr, and the physicist Christian Christiansen. And Niels Bohr remembers that this was a particularly important influence on him. He was particularly close to his uh, brother. And this is a photo from 1902, which Harald actually gave to Bohr as a birthday present uh, in 1911, when Niels Bohr was in Cambridge. And uh, he wrote to Niels about the picture. I think it symbolizes a certain aspect of our relationship with one another. My impudence and your being a little embarrassed on my behalf, but also, as it was I who said it, whatever that was, and as we always have been a little fond of each other, then you think nevertheless in all your niceness that it was nevertheless quite amusing to have such an impudent little brother. So that was a very strong uh, relationship throughout their lives. And Christian Bohr, the father, was uh, a very strong influence also. Uh, he was definitely a role model for Niels Bohr, and uh, I think this, uh, these two pictures illustrate that. Um, you know, they were uh, photographed at the same table at the same time in 1911, uh, just before Niels, uh, Christian Bohr died, actually. And Niels Bohr dedicated uh, the, his doctoral di dissertation to his newly deceased father, uh, which was only months later. And uh, later, in correspondence with Margrethe Nörland, his fiancée, uh, you can sense uh, what importance Christian Bohr had on Bohr. He writes in a Christmas letter of 21 December 1911, you have never met such a perfect man. I think that he sat and thought about this world and perhaps about his own childhood. Look at him. This father never said a word to his little boy about anything having to do with belief or doubt. And when the little boy had grown older and after his own lonely battles, one day came and told his father that he could not imagine anything as dreadful and terrible as that as that which he had believed in with his whole little soul. Also then his father said nothing, but only smiled at his eagerness. That smile, my little one, has taught the little boy a lot. This was about a religious crisis in Bohr's life that he got over and uh, that seemed to be accepted by, by his father. And then, we have uh, the mother. This is not the mother. This is Margrethe Bohr. But uh, Margrethe Bohr, uh, she was ill uh, quite often uh, during her youth. This was after they had uh, engaged and before uh, Niels Bohr went to England. But Niels Bohr didn't have time for Margrethe at the time anyway, because he was writing on his dissertation someplace else in, in uh, Denmark. So his mother took care of uh, Margrethe reading Dickens to her. They were very literary oriented. And um, Margrethe went through a crisis wondering whether she should dedicate her entire life to Nils, or whether she should have her own career, at least partly, as a teacher. And uh, after she had told her uh, prospective uh, mother-in-law this, uh, the mother-in-law writes to Margrethe, I think that the task you have chosen to tie your life to such a rare nature as Nils is the best evidence of your own rare nature. 
And if you could make his life, and thus your own, so rich and happy as you can with your loving, mild and gentle character, then this purpose is a sacred purpose and great purpose, just as serious and just as good as, as if you devoted your strength to studies or other activities that could give you what in your foolish little mind you think that you are lacking, <laughs> the ability to talk about all kinds of things. Well, I don't think that would have, I don't think that would have worked very well today with, um, with Margrethe. It, uh, it worked. And uh, Niels Bohr also had expectations of Margrethe. Uh, here he is writing just after finish his dissertation. Uh, when I'm walking in the garden, I'm sometimes thinking how wonderful our life will be. Next time I write something that I find difficult, then we will perhaps be married, and then we will perhaps go to Hornbeck, that's a place in Denmark, or some other place together and write together. I have been thinking of so many wonderful things these days. How great everything is going to be if only I can manage to behave myself. But it means that the for the time being that I am working hard and do not think of other things than the stupid, stupid, stupid book. <laughs> and that was uh, a development of his dissertation, I'm sure. Now, as I said, Margrethe took this to heart. This is quite an interesting document. It is a notebook. And um, the cover has Niels Bohr's um, handwriting on it. It's a list of names to whom he sent his dissertation. And uh, the content of the book, the entire content of the book, which lists 255 people that he sent his dissertation to, uh, is in Margrethe Bohr's handwriting. So, you know, there you can see Max Planck, you can see Albert Einstein. He sent it to family and friends. So, uh, Margrethe was quite involved in his work. Pardon? Oh, well, he wrote it in Danish. Because in, um, in Denmark at the time, you could uh, write a dissertation in three languages only. One was Danish, another was Swedish, and uh, another was Latin. You could not write it in, in, ah. in, in English. That was not allowed. So the copy he sent to these people was... No, it was a translation into English. But it was, it was not a very good translation, because it was translated by a person who was good in English, but didn't know any physics, practically. So there were many strange, <laughs> many strange translations there. <laughs> well... Another influential family member was his mother's sister, Hannah Adler, who is seen here later on with the two brothers. But let's get to England. No, I should first show you a, a, a postcard that Niels Bohr sent to his mother from Norway, uh, where he spent Christmas with, with uh, his aunt. He did that a couple of times, so they were very close. Okay, now let's get to England. Now we're in England, right? Um, well, as uh, is well known, he had uh, difficulties with J.J. Thompson, who would never read Bohr's dissertation, as far as we know, even after it was presented to him in an improved, improved English translation. He had basically only one friend in Cambridge, and his name was Edward Augustine Owen, uh, who was knowledgeable about the electron theory that Niels Bohr had written about in his dissertation. So they had a lot of things together, and he also helped translating um, his dissertation. Now, his first experience in Manchester. On the 4th of November, 19. 1911, Niels Bohr found himself in Manchester for the very first time. And that was due to his father's acquaintances and colleagues, namely, in particular, one James Lorraine Smith, who was a pathologist. And he writes to his mother about his first experience here. Dear little mother, just a little morning greeting from Manchester. I'm sitting in Lauren Smith's office writing. We are just about to leave together to look at the city's various sites. 
I would just send this along to say how exceedingly wonderful it is for me to be among real friends again. Your own nails. I mean, that is not uh, a very good uh, evaluation of, 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 of his life in Cambridge. S and this is uh, James Lorraine Smith. Uh, I found it on the net, as you can see. It's not very good. Now, what did, do, what did uh, Nils do you know, in, Manche in, in, in Cambridge when he did not do physics? Well, he concentrated quite a lot on reading literature. Uh, the first book he took up was Dickens in English this time. Of course, it was all, all translated, so he had read it all in uh, Danish before. But now that is, that's his... Uh, uh, attempt to learn English in part, and he shares the experience with Margarita. And I think it's quite interesting uh, that uh, he writes to uh, Margarita on 22 February 1912 uh, regarding James Larmor, uh, Larmor's book Ether and Matter. He, he writes, I had completely forgotten how amusing it was for me to read Larmor's book. When I, read something that is, when I read something that is so good and grand, then I feel such courage and desire to see whether I too could accomplish a little something. Tell me, will you help me? And then, to read Othello. I can only say that when I read something like that, then I feel all my undeserved happiness. And that is that my little darling is the largest and best in the whole world. So he's actually combining the experience of uh, what we would uh, consider uh, normal literature today with uh, the physics literature, which, is, which is just, seems to be just as literary for Niels Bohr. So there's an interesting combination there. Uh, well, he had a literary flair himself. And here's a fairly long quote from the same Christmas letter that I told you about before, where, where he described his, uh, where, where, where he uh, described his father. Uh, he writes, and then we fly out above the great ocean, but we do not fly the shortest route, for it is Christmas Eve, and we fly further north where Christmas lives. See, see the great lit house in the middle of the snow, see, the spruces completely covered with snow making fantastic figures, and see the stars shining and glimmering in the frosty night, and see the moon which lights up everything more sharply and glaringly than the brightest sunshine. See, see, for that no human being has seen who has not been far north. See the beamed hall and the mighty fire and the gigantic Christmas tree and all the happy people. See, there is the little boy and his aunt and cousin. The little boy has grown up and talks about philosophy with an old gentleman. But we do not enter. And still, that Christmas night, when he went to bed, his courage roared so wildly, so wildly, for he thinks that he too could think. And images rolled up before him. My little one, can you care for him? See his silly, wild presumption, what came out of it. My own little darling, if you will care for him, he will try to find meaning in his wild courage. If, with all your infinite love, you will pay the debt for his poor soul, he will try out whether he too can get something out of it. And I can't help showing you this painting by uh, a famous uh, Norwegian uh, painter, at least famous in Norway, um, who is called um, Harald uh, Solberg. It's called Winter Night in Rondon. It's from 1901, but I think it depicts the sense that Niels Bohr gave there. And then, Margrethe also has a great literary interest. And uh, she recommends Thomas Carlyle to uh, her uh, prospective husband, husband. And Niels Bohr reacts, oh, my little one, I cannot describe what I felt. I do not know whether it is Carlyle so much. I am so fond of his style and look forward to reading more. But always, when I see the briefest reference to the old Nordic countries, then my heart flare up, flares up so wildly, so wildly, my little one. I dream I am among Norway's cliffs and skerries. My own little darling, tell me, if you would come with me to Iceland in the Viking ship, tell me if you would, and tell me 
if you, in addition, would stay behind on your own in Iceland when I had to leave in the summer. Please do not mind that I sit and dream these evenings. We will go to you, Dunheim, this summer, but shh, not a word. Even Carlyle saw it as something most alluring about the old Norwegians that they did not say what they intended to do. Uh, so even when he's uh, reading English literature, it brings him up north uh, to, to, uh, to closer to home. And uh, here is what Margrethe uh, answers. If I will come with you to Iceland in a Viking ship, and if I will sit and wait in the summer, if I will, yes, you can be sure that I will. Oh, Nils, it would be wonderful. I come to you, Nils, as Solvay came to Per Gint. I come to you alone. You will be everything to me, both friend and comforter. And here you have uh, uh, Solvay or Margrethe uh, waiting for uh, Per Gint or Nils Bohr uh, in Norway or in uh, Iceland. Um, yes. And then, on the 15th of February 1912, well, this is, he writes a poem to, uh, to, to, to his beloved one. Uh, no, I shall gather you up with such care and lock you away as heart's treasure. There you can play your whole life long. The game that you've learned gives most pleasure. Where is that from? Anybody knows? <laughs> you know that? <laughs> well, you, 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 you're not allowed. You're not allowed. <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's part of what John and I have been writing on. So, you know, he's not qualified to, to, to answer that question. Or it is too qualified to answer that question. But it is uh, Ibsen again, uh, it's Ibsen's brand. And then later on in the letter he writes, for you will pay all the debt for me that my poor little soul may incur. And where does he have that picture from? Well, later on in uh, the same uh, drama, uh, Ibsen writes, uh, Brand is speaking to his dying mother. The soul once winged for aspiration, you've wing clipped into worldliness. That is your debt, what shall you do when God requires his own of you? What shall I do? What then? Don't fret. Your son takes on himself your debt. Of course, this has strong religious implications, which it didn't have for Bohr, but uh, it's the same mode of, of, of thinking. And, uh, well, He's also writing to uh, Margrethe about more day-to-day -day things. On the 15th of February 2012, Bohr, Bohr was still in uh, Cambridge. And he writes to uh, Margrethe, Yesterday I would have asked you whether if my plans are realized, as at the moment I think best, you might want to be like a mother to my students. For otherwise, I would never have the strength myself to try to be a little bit of a father to them. I am thinking of father, of everything that he has been to so many, many. Will you help me just to dare think of his example? And this was a prophetic statement because this was exactly what Margrethe was to become throughout their whole life. And Margrethe answers, there are no limits at all to how much I wish that I could be allowed to try to be a mother to your students and how we will think about your father together. How, 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 am, I, how am I for time? That's okay? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Hannah Adler, who I mentioned before, she was a pioneer Danish woman she was the woman in Denmark when she had a degree in physics. That was something uh, in itself. But she was also the woman who introduced co-education in Denmark. And Niels Bohr was actually quite involved in her pedagogical work. And he taught uh, at the school that she had, ex that she had established. And uh, he writes to her on, the, on 21 December 1911. However, the bridge, that is the Newton Bridge in Cambridge, the bridge there now, which you see in the picture, is 
from what I heard the other day, supposed to contain a quite extraordinarily large number of nails. For when the old bridge was in a state of disrepair and a new one was constructed on the basis of the old, the constructors could not find out how it could be assembled without nails. And when they first started to use nails, they could not be stopped until they had put nails in all the places where it was possible. I don't know if all this needs to be said. I suppose it will depend on the pedagogical principles involved. You know, this was something to be presented to her, to her students. And this is uh, the bridge. Uh, it's not the uh, bridge, the, 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 yeah, it's not what Nils sent to, um, to Hannah, it's a newer picture, but that's, that's the bridge at, at any rate. And as I said before, he was very, very close to his brother. And his brother uh, visited him in Cambridge, actually, in January uh, 1911. That was something that Niels looked very, very much forward to. And Harald Bohr, you know, he was perhaps a little more open than Niels Bohr was. In any case, he writes to their mother on the 8th of January 1912, Niels will probably only stay for one more term in Cambridge and will probably go to Manchester for the last term. The year has three terms. To work with Rutherford, whom we met at Lorraine Smith's and whom he likes a lot. However, you should not talk about it, as Niels's plans are not quite fixed yet. So, um, you know, a lot of things happens by chance, and uh, it was a good thing that he finally decided to, to go up there. Uh, by the way, Niels Bohr has misremembered uh, how he first met Rutherford. This was actually the first time he met uh, Rutherford in, uh, um, in, in, in uh, Manchester at, at his first visit there in November, I think it was. Uh, the uh, uh, meeting in Cambridge later was uh, at Christmas time. Uh, all right. Now we come to Manchester. So what kind of experience did he report from Manchester to his family and his coming wife? He moved there on the 15th of March 1912, I believe it was. And there is no mention of work, people, or milieu there in personal letters until 28 April, when he only says that he spends time at the laboratory every day from 9 to 6. That's not too much to go by. His, one of his major concerns was his future in Denmark. Uh, he visited Denmark at Easter, uh, and uh, the visit was motivated to a great extent by whether or not to apply for the professorship there that was now open, uh, open after his teacher Christian Christiansen was retiring. And he was quite aware that he would probably not get it uh, because it was a 14 year older uh, colleague, uh, Martin Knudsen, uh, who also applied. Uh, who would be more likely to get it. And he, had, he has this uh, correspondence with uh, his brother about this. And uh, at first, he, he, he is advised not to, to apply, because if he applies, that might not uh, be too well uh, received by Martin Knudsen, his competitor. Uh, and then he might not automatically uh, employ him as uh, the assistant that goes with the professorship. Um, but he decided to apply anyway for this. This is Martin Knudsen uh, from the internet, as you can see. Uh, he decided to apply anyway. And uh, Harald and Nils Bohr had a very close colleague in Sweden, the physicist Carl Wilhelm Usain. And Harald Bohr uh, writes to Wilhelm Usain, uh, there are plans which I would ask you to consider confidential on behalf of a large circle in the faculty of Copenhagen University to seek to bypass my brother completely when filling both positions, that is the professorship and the assistant, uh, assistantship. It would, for, it would for many years, maybe forever, be impossible for my brother to get a, an academic post at the university. That's fairly strong stuff. 
1912, he was 27. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he was very young. And um, well, Carl Wilhelm Hussein was ill at the time. He was not able to write this letter of recommendation in any case. But uh, in all likelihood, uh, Niels Bohr would not have received the professorship in, uh, anyway. He, he, he had to wait. But there was great concern in the family, as one can see, about uh, Niels's future. Um, Aunt Hanna reported later that uh, Christiansen, uh, the, the, the original professor, uh, approved of Bohr's application, but that didn't help either. He didn't want to involve himself. And while in uh, Denmark at this time, Niels Bohr also ended his membership in the Danish state church, which you get by birth and you have to end if you don't want to be part of that. And here is one of my favorite pictures. This is Margrethe and Niels in uh, Denmark, uh, that the Easter that he visited there. And uh, when uh, Niels Bohr returns to Manchester, he writes to Margrethe, I long so much for really starting together with you, long for taking my whole life, the realization of all my dreams and plans as a gift from you. And uh, the continuing correspondence has a lot to do with the wedding, obtaining furniture, living quarters, and that kind of thing. Then he goes away again uh, from the uh, 19th of April to the 22nd of April. This time he goes to Edinburgh, where uh, his mother has family. And um, Margrethe uh, had told his parents at this time that Nils and uh, she and Nils was not going to marry in church. And Nils prom promised to write to his uh, prospective, uh, prospective uh, yeah, in law in laws uh, and explain it. But he does not do that while in in Edinburgh. I'll drop that. Uh, but this is uh, an important letter, I think. It is uh, from Nils to Margrethe on the 23rd of April, describing his trip to Edinburgh. And he had been to uh, a sermon at the Edinburgh Cathedral. And this was just after Titanic had sunk. And the point of the priest was that uh, this uh, disaster was predetermined by God. <laughs> and uh, Bohr gets, gets very upset about this. And he writes to Margrethe, it is scarcely poorer and all things are scarcely less just because one understands that human beings cannot know whether such answers as the predetermination of the Titanic disaster are true or not. Human beings cannot not know or more correctly they do not know and can, in the nature of the matter, not know what it would mean if they were true or not. And then he has a fairly, fairly uncharacteristic continuation about priests. And talking about priests, then it may be convenient to recall that it is usually only the less gifted who think that they can explain anything at all by the pious misunderstandings they call religion. But the sharper ones, as you certainly know, tend to emphasize as the most important aspect of religion that there are more things in the world than people can understand, only they tend to forget to say that human beings can understand that is, this is the way it had to be. So what's the use of priests, in other words? Yes. and. Um, uh, he has other duties in Manchester. His uh, aunt Hannah uh, sends him a letter of introduction to one Mr. Mason out in Didsbury, which he received on the 18th of April. And uh, the visit finally materializes a little more than a month later. And uh, it turns out that in his letter to Aunt Hannah, that Nils was quite worried that he had scared Mr. Mason by telling him, telling him that the radium water he was taking for his rheumatism would have only one thousandth 
of its original effect left when it finished up the bottle after one month. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, the belief in radium for several purposes was fairly strong at that time, and uh, Mr. Mason was clearly very disappointed. This is also the letter in which Niels Bohr describes Rutherford, his experience with Rutherford for the first time, and this is uh, more than two months after he arrived there. And he writes to his aunt, Professor Rutherford was precisely such a man as I thought, and takes such great interest in each and every one who works with him. How much can come out of the little thing he has set me to work on, I do not know yet. But I have in any case learned so much being with him, and I will learn much more before I leave here. So, you know, Niels Bohr was a good student uh, at that time. He didn't seem to have much of his own uh, project. And he's also very concerned about Harold's illness. He writes back and forth to his mother about this. And he never wrote, as he promised to Margrethe, to his parents-in-law um, about, uh, about their decision not to marry in church. But he is forced to write when Sophie and Earl and Margrethe's mother uh, writes to him and says, what is this? I mean, this is ridiculous. She was very religious and doesn't understand this at all. And Nils Bohr answers, um, and he's, 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 fairly, he's fairly adamant. We could not act otherwise than according to our conviction. But suddenly I understood that all of it was not true. Understood it in a way that to me was beyond any doubt. Understood it just as definitely as I understand that the most tangible things are not true. And you should know that I understood it on my own. I had never heard a single word in that direction at home. I am so immensely grateful to my father and mother for that. But you must not think that I do not believe in anything at all. I believe that there is a meaning in the world a meaning that human beings cannot understand, but only can sense. With regard to the question of the wedding, I must unfortunately say once more that we cannot act otherwise, as I believe that it is our duty. You must remember what kind of man my father, here comes the father again, was, and how he lived and died, and in what way we found it most proper to seek to honor his memory. And as it now so happens that it is both my greatest and my own full and firm conviction, I cannot, in the light of his memory, defend concealing my viewpoint on such an occasion. That's a fairly strong answer to his uh, religious uh, mother, actually, he, 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 he calls her. And, uh, but they, they, they remained on good terms, actually, so she, she accepted that um, in the end. Now, his concern for having his dissertation pu published continued in Manchester. Uh, he got a letter on the 9th of May from the Cambridge Philosophical Society that uh, they might publish it if he halved it. And he considered that for a while, but then he writes to Harald Bohr uh, on the 27th of May, uh, that he had changed his mind again, he was going back and forth about this. Today, <laughs> I would really like to have it published in full, for I believe that I have found out something which, if it is true, and as far as I can see, nobody can claim the opposite before my experiments are made, some that I am thinking of doing next year together with Owen, if no one has done them in the meantime, he lost parenthesis, will remove all the main objections that can be raised and have lately been raised against an electron theory of the kind I have treated. And indeed, if that is the case, the value of my work will be a little different from what it is now considered to be. I mean, he's learned British understatement here, it seems to me. <laughs> I wanted so much to talk to you tonight, for here I have no one who, really, who is really interested in such things. You also, so, so he feels very lonely with regard to his uh, theoretical work, also in Manchester. 
Uh, and then he says, you also ask about the work in the laboratory. It is really going quite well. Unfortunately, I must say right off that I am not yet sure how much will come of what Rutherford has put me on. So there's a complete distinction between his work with Rutherford and the other people in Manchester and his own theoretical interests that constitutes his, um, his, 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 his main ambition. And then the day after, he, he writes, it can explain certain difficulties of a general nature in the electron theory of metals, such as the fact, incomprehensible on the basis of simple consideration, that the Thomson effect, as you may remember, apparently is of the wrong order of magnitude, and also that the specific heat of metals is not larger at low temperatures, a difficulty that I believe you have heard of. I mean, they were really communicating to each other about their, uh, shared, their, their, their interests. I mean, Andreas, uh, uh, <laughs> Niels learned mathematics from Harald, and Harald learned physics from, from Niels. But whether it will be possible to explain the more specific matters which depend on the particular conditions under which the electrons move in the metal is something else again. And um, he plans to publish the dissertation on his own expense. Uh, he is... Uh, he is advised against to do that. Um, and uh, he writes that he would continue to work on his electron theory when he's back in Copenhagen. And he writes again on the 4th of June how wonderful it is to be able to work on theory when waiting for radium at the lab. And then he visits London to see... Uh, to see, to see my greatest brother, you know, so he's occupied by all kinds of family things in, uh, in Denmark. <coughs> all right, now things change. And there is a letter to my greater from the 4th of June, 1912, where he reports, and he has hardly written about his science to my greater before, a young, very clever mathematician C.G. Darwin, grandson of the real Darwin, <laughs> who is a sort of reader in mathematical physics here, but it may be a, get a bit heated, for I'm not sure that we agree. Shh. I promise to write to you another day and tell you how <coughs> it went. <laughs> and then, a few days later, more exactly six days later, Eight days later, I can't, I can't calculate it anymore. Uh, he writes to Harald more specifically about uh, what they disagree about. I am not getting along badly at the moment. A couple of days ago, I had a little idea with regard to understanding the absorption of alpha rays. It happened in this way. A young mathematician here, C.G. Darwin, again, grandson of the real Darwin, he likes that, has just published a theory about this problem. And I felt that it not only wasn't quite right mathematically, however, only slightly wrong. <laughs> That's a little bit counter to what Darwin said before here. Uh, but very unsatisfactory in the basic conception. And I have worked out a little theory about it, which, even if it isn't much, perhaps may throw some light on certain things connected with the structure of atoms. Believe me. It is interesting to be here. There are so many to talk to here, all of a sudden. And then in parentheses, my complaints last time applied to the more general theoretical problems. And among them are those who understand such things best, namely the things that he's discussing with Darwin. And Professor Rutherford takes a real and effective interest in everything he considers worthwhile. So suddenly, he's integrated in the milieu in uh, Manchester. Uh, <coughs> at a fairly uh, late date, though, this is on the 12th of June, uh, 1912. And then he writes to Harald again. This is the full letter. Perhaps I have found out a little about the structure of atoms. Don't talk about it to anybody, for otherwise I couldn't write to you about it so soon. 
If I should be right, it wouldn't be a suggestion of the nature of a possibility, i.e. an impossibility as J.J. Thompson's theory, but perhaps a little bit of reality. It has grown out of a little information I got from the absorption of alpha rays, the little theory I wrote about last time. You understand that I may yet be wrong, for it hasn't been worked out fully yet, but I don't think so. Also, <coughs> I do not believe that Rutherford thinks that it is completely wild. He is a man of the right sort, and he would never say that he was convinced of something that was not fully worked out. Believe me, I am eager to finish it in a hurry, and to do that I have taken off a couple of days from the laboratory. This is also a secret. <laughs> This was intended only as a little greeting from your Nils, who is longing very much <laughs> to talk to you. So on the, on the 29th of June, he writes that uh, he would like to have a paper to show to Rutherford on Monday. Maybe that is the Rutherford Memorandum, it's possible. Or do you call it the Bohr Memorandum? Mm, and. Uh, now, he also writes to Margrethe about his science, his physics, but in a little more different mode than to Harald. Perhaps it nevertheless does not look so hopeless with the little atoms. Even if the outcome of the battles goes up and down, for while they defend themselves most successfully, that is, of course, precisely when they allow a glimpse of what their weapons and strength consist of. But that perhaps is most dangerous, dangerous for their lasting security, at least when the one who attacks has a place where he can rest and gather new courage. Little silly child, that seems to be how matters stand. Whether I will have time to finish something before I come home is becoming more and more doubtful. As the days pass and the substance, and with that the difficulties, grows and grows at the same time. But may I be allowed to think that we will help each other. On the 19th of July, uh, only half the paper has been written. <laughs> and on the 22nd of Ju July, he goes down to Owen in Bangor to have him help with the translation. And he has definitely not finished with uh, the paper uh, by the time uh, he goes back uh, to uh, to Denmark on the 25th of July. And you know, they had been planning a, uh, a honeymoon to Norway, his beloved Norway, but now, not having finished the paper, there is no time for that. So, well, he has a morning wedding so that they can get off in the evening. And um, uh, they go to London, uh, they go to Cambridge and Manchester where he can finish the paper with Rutherford, and then they do have a honeymoon in Loch Lomond after all that. <laughs> but finishing the, the paper was very important to him. Yes, and then uh, I dropped that, I think. Yes, and then he goes back to Copenhagen, and he develops uh, the first uh, part of the trilogy, which contains the atomic model. And this is just one page of scribblings from that period. And then, uh, as, as Niels Bohr himself told us earlier today, uh, he uh, had to go to Manchester in order to convince Rutherford that the paper should be as long as it had become. And when there, after having talked to Rutherford, he writes to Margrethe, I have spoken so pleasantly with Rutherford, and I look forward so much to coming home and to really get going and try to get the other parts done quickly. Shall we really try? My dearest little one, Rutherford should only know that it is you who have, have to do it all. And I think that is a better conclusion than I can conjure up myself. So I stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.